I want to thank everybody for coming out. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Brian Snowdy, and I will be your guest lecturer uh, today. And our subject matter, of course, is the Kennedy assassination. And this is something I've been doing research on now for more than 10 years. And my research led me to meet and then eventually befriend an ex-mafia associate who was in Dallas that day. He was knee-deep involved in this stuff, and he really helped me connect a lot of dots. And we'll talk to him a little later on today. He's quite a character. Speaking of characters, that's what I call this thing, the cast of characters. Who was in Dallas that day, and who knew who? How were some of these guys connected? And that's the thing that really got me, and I think it's going to shock the pants even off of some of you Kennedy buffs out here. Uh, this is by no means any definitive list. There are literally dozens of other players that I will not be mentioning. We just don't have the time to go over everyone, and I wanted to focus on the ones that I've done the most research on. So for some reason, if I leave out your personal favorite conspirator, I'm just going to have to live with it. <laughs> so, and I'd like you to save all your questions and comments till the end. I have quite a bit of stuff to go over, and I can get distracted pretty easily. So we'll save questions and comments for the end. Here's a picture of our 35th president appearing in a format you wouldn't normally expect to see him in. He's on a wanted poster. And this wanted poster was produced and distributed by Texas oil tycoon H.L. Hunt. And these posters were thrown all over Dallas the week that Kennedy was going to arrive, accusing the president of treason. By the way, treason carries a death penalty. Well, at least it used to. Obviously, it doesn't anymore. And Hunt lists the seven reasons why he believes Kennedy is guilty of this particular crime. But he leaves out a personal reason why he hates Kennedy. And that personal reason was Kennedy wanted to cut something called the oil depletion allowance, which was kind of a tax loophole that these tycoons used to save millions of dollars on taxes every year. And this made Kennedy a big time enemy of the Texas oil men. Kennedy made a lot of enemies in the White House. Uh, we're told Lee Harvey Oswald shot President Kennedy from the sixth floor of that Texas School Book Depository building on November 22, 1963. Why? Because he wanted to become famous and he didn't like the president. I mean, those are the reasons we're given to this day. And you talk to any good murder police out there, they're going to tell you find your motive, you're going to find your killer. So this is Oswald's motive. Look at the motive some other people wanted Kennedy out of the way. We mentioned the oil tycoons. Kennedy also did a pretty darn good job of pissing off the Mafia. He appointed his brother Bobby Kennedy as Attorney General, and Bobby was going after the mob like this country had never even heard of before. And this is only a few short years after J. Edgar Hoover, head of the FBI, who by the way hated the Kennedy's guts, told the American public that the Mafia didn't even exist. The Mafia agreed with J. Edgar Hoover. Some members of the Mafia had been hired by the CIA to kill Fidel Castro. Joseph P. Kennedy, President Kennedy's father, had made a backdoor deal with Mafia boss out of Chicago, Sam Momo Giancana, to put his son in the White House in the first place. And through massive voter fraud, this was done. When the Kennedys still kept going after Giancana, he felt double-crossed. A lot of other gangsters did too, it wasn't just him. Kennedy pissed off the CIA. He fired Alan Dulles, head of CIA, who later became head of the Warren Commission, investigating Kennedy's murder. No conflict of interest there. Uh, after this disastrous Bay of Pigs catastrophe, this invasion of Cuba that the CIA cooked up and then screwed up, Kennedy had enough of Dulles' nonsense and he fired him. And he fired a couple other top guys in that outfit too. And uh, he uh, alleged to have said he was going to break the CIA up into a thousand pieces and scatter it into the wind, which of course he was never able to do. Kennedy pissed off the state of Israel. Nobody ever wants to touch that little smoking hand grenade. He was very vocal about Israel not having nuclear weapons, and he wanted all Israeli lobbyists in the United States to be labeled as foreign agents, not lobbyists. Uh, by the way, Itzhak Rabin just happened to be in Dallas, Texas that day. Coincidence? We're going to see a lot of these coincidences pop up, so keep an eye out for them. I may even point some out to you. Kennedy pissed off the military-industrial complex. He wanted us out of Vietnam. He issues a presidential memorandum in October right before he's killed, saying he wants to start withdrawing troops from Vietnam by Christmas time. I'm sorry, did I say troops? I meant military advisors, of course. He had about 17,000 people there. Kennedy wants everyone up and out of there by 1965. Just a few short days after he's killed, the new president, Lyndon Johnson, reverses that order. 
and we had something called the Vietnam War. 58,000 dead Americans officially, but nobody ever wants to talk about the tens of thousands who came home, committed suicide, drank themselves to death, died with a heroin needle sticking out of their arm, died of Agent Orange cancer, packed the VA hospitals with shattered bodies and shattered minds, and um, to this very day, there are homeless Vietnam vets sleeping on the streets in every major city in this country. And if that doesn't make you sick and angry, I think there's something wrong with you. And by the way, Lyndon Johnson personally made millions and millions and millions of dollars off that war, and so did a lot of his buddies. And Kennedy pissed off the Federal Reserve Banking Cartel. He actually had the audacity to print some of our own currency. I know, how dare you do that? Instead of borrowing from the Federal Reserve Banks and paying it back plus interest, he prints currency backed by silver we the people own. The last president to do something similar to that was a guy named Abraham Lincoln. Ever heard of him? I don't think it was a coincidence that both of these two guys were shot in the head in public. But that's just my speculation. Kennedy also pissed a few other people off. Jimmy Hoffa hated the president's guts, especially Bobby. He hated both the Kennedys. And he was head of the Teamsters Union, and he was mobbed up to his eyeballs. Yeah, maybe we better get that. It's getting a little crazy out there. Uh, <clears throat> Kennedy also wanted to release all information that the United States government had on UFOs to the American public. And uh, U.S. Steel wasn't too happy with Kennedy because they were rigging steel prices and he put a stop to that too. <coughs> now these are some pretty heavy hitters I just mentioned here. Now, these guys had the power to knock Kennedy's lights out and some of them had the power to cover it up. So keep that in mind. Speaking of cover-ups, here's the next guy we got in the White House, Lyndon Baines Johnson. Lyndon Johnson just so happened to be a born-again psychopath. One chronicler out there describes Johnson as an American Caligula. I don't think he's off base, neither. This is a guy who tied a stick of dynamite to a dog's head when he was a kid. He beat a mule to death in the middle of a street with an axe handle, right in front of a bunch of people. Lyndon Johnson lied, cheated, stole, manipulated, and murdered his way to the top. Johnson is tied somewhere between 10 and 17 murders, including the killing of his own sister, Josepha. We'll talk about her in a minute. Johnson <clears throat> decides he's going to stuff the ballot box when he's running for U.S. Senate. This famous ballot box 13 incident, where after recount of said ballot box, all of a sudden there's 201 brand new signatures in alphabetical order, in the same handwriting, in the same colored ink. And Johnson's a new senator from Texas. People are walking up to him and shaking his hand and calling him Landslide Linden. Well, they called him Lying Linden behind his back. I'm thinking maybe if they called him lying Lyndon to his face, some of this other nonsense wouldn't have happened. But, again, my speculation. By the time 1963 rolls around and Kennedy's ready to get whacked, Lyndon Johnson is getting ready to go to prison. Life magazine is doing an expose on Johnson. When it comes out, it's going to transfer him from the White House to the Big House. They got him nailed on two of the biggest scandals in America. This Bobby Baker character, basically the bag man of the U.S. Senate, and Billy Celestes is running around ripping off the government. Millions of dollars, these crooked land and grain swindles, and these cotton allotment scams. And Johnson is eyeballs deep in with both of those two characters. And by the way, both of them went to the joint, too. They both went to prison. And Johnson just danced through the raindrops. Kennedy gets, well, actually, here's another thing that they're working on as well. They're, trying, they're sitting around scratching their head, trying to figure out how Lyndon Johnson, who's only been a school teacher, military, public sector jobs. He's making less than 18 grand a year when he's senator. He's worth $25 million. I mean, where's he getting all this got all? Kennedy gets whacked, and Johnson becomes president of the United States. And by the way, Johnson's best friend and next door neighbor for years, J. Edgar Hoover, whitewashes Lyndon. And those scandals never raise their heads in any real significance ever again. Here's a picture of Johnson right here, aboard Air Force One, taking the oath of office. And he just so happened to have a copy of the swearing-in ceremony in his pocket. Another coincidence. And by the way, this is not constitutionally required. So why'd he do it? And look at that. He's getting a wink here. A wink and a smile from his buddy, Albert Thomas. And you can tell Johnson's smiling, too. Look at his face. He's all crinkled up here. Here's Jackie over here looking shell-shocked. And these two mama loops are having a day at the races. They're having a good time. I mean, this is one of these pictures that says like a thousand words, you know? I think there's a book and a half in this picture. 
And speaking of books, they didn't even use a real Bible. It was just a Catholic prayer book they pulled out of Kennedy's room. That Johnson wouldn't know the difference. <laughs> yes. When Johnson gets into the big chair, his aides describe him as unhinged. He's screaming and yelling and throwing temper tantrums over piddly little nothings. <clears throat> He's often just liquored up out of his mind. He spends days and days in his room with the door closed, refusing to speak to anyone. When he emerges, no explanation whatsoever. He's banging every piece of coups he can get his hands on, and while he's in the White House, he's got three illegitimate kids. He's so crazy, he pulls his dick out one time and whacks it on a, on a table right in front of a bunch of news reporters. He goes aboard Air Force One, takes his clothes off, wanders around naked in the airplane, right in front of people. And his favorite thing to do is when he's sitting on the toilet, taking a dump, he likes to force his aides to stand around him as they write down notes in regarding his scheduling and so forth. I mean, this guy should be in the White House. He should be in an asylum. After six years of this, he says, forget about it. I, okay, he doesn't say forget about it. But he doesn't want to be president anymore. He gives that famous speech, if nominated, I will not run. If elected, I will not serve. Yakety, yakety, blah, blah, blah. He retires to his ranch where he tells everyone that he's going to become a college professor. The only problem is he never leaves that ranch. He's seeing a psychiatrist the entire time he's there, and he stops cutting his hair. And in four short years, Lyndon Johnson basically smokes and drinks himself to death. That's the guy we got in the White House. And I can assure you what's been in that White House since him, just as bad, not worse. Different flavors of corruption is what we got. And I can tell you it's a goddamn freak show in that White House today. We're in trouble. This character right here is uh, Clint Murchison Jr. He was a, a Texas oil tycoon and a big Lyndon Johnson supporter. He had like a little mini ranch right there in Dallas, right there in the city. Uh, the night before Kennedy's killed, there was a party at that ranch. Attendees of that party were Lyndon Johnson, Richard Nixon, former vice president, future president, John J. McCloy, future member of the Warren Commission, Gerald Ford, future member of the Warren Commission, and future president. George Bush Sr., future member of the, uh, of the presidency and member of CIA. And Clyde Tolson, and uh, I should say an FBI director, um, J. Edgar Hoover, and his allegedly gay boyfriend, Clyde Tolson, from the FBI. Amongst others, there were other people there. Now, when Lyndon Johnson gets out of that meeting very late at night, he arrived very late. In fact, most people didn't even expect to see him. He told his girlfriend, Madeline Brown, who also attended that meeting, who also had a kid with Johnson, Come tomorrow, those blankety-blank Kennedy brothers are never going to embarrass me again. That's not a threat, that's a promise. And before the first shot rang off in Daily Plaza, Lyndon Johnson was already face down in the back seat of that car. When news reporters asked why they couldn't see his head when the motorcade drove by, he said, oh, I dropped the pen. He later changed the story on the Secret Service, really shoved me down that car. Interesting, because you can see Lady Bird the whole time. How come the Secret Service didn't shove her down in that car? Hmm. Now, Clint Murkison, being a man of much wealth, also owned some interesting properties. By the way, for you football fans out there, he owned the Dallas Cowboys at the time. He owned the Del Mar Racetrack, where J. Edgar Hoover and Clyde Tolson were regular fixtures. He also owned the Del Charo Hotel in Southern California, where J. Edgar Hoover and Clyde Tolson vacationed every single summer for 10 years in a row. And they never paid one penny in bills. There's a guy on the internet out there that estimates they racked up somewhere in the neighborhood of $300,000 in unpaid bills. That's in the millions in today's money. <laughs> Must be nice to be American royalty, huh? Other regulars and attendees of that hotel are names you might be a little familiar with, such as uh, Lyndon Johnson, Richard Nixon, and H.L. Hunt, Texas oil tycoon. Oh, and since J. Edgar Hoover didn't believe that the mafia existed, he might have been a tiny bit surprised some other regular attendees, such as Meyer Lansky, Johnny Rosselli, Santo Traficante, Carlos Marcello, and Sam Momo Giancana. I mean, these are the biggest names in the history of organized crime in this country. Speaking of the Mafia, the Murchisons had direct ties to the Genovese crime family in New York City. Vito Genovese personally owned stock in Murchison's companies, and lots of it. In the late 1970s, Fat Tony Salerno, the then head of the Genovese crime family, told the DC Insider that they had business relations with the Murchisons, both legitimate and illegitimate businesses. Wonder what those illegitimate businesses might have been. This character right here is a guy named Malcolm Wallace. 
Malcolm Wallace was Lyndon Johnson's personal hitman. He was a Texas native and a real lantern-jawed tough guy, too. He was an ex-Marine, and he was highly intelligent. And Wallace was also a college-educated man. He went to the University of Texas, where he later even taught a class, and supposedly went to Columbia. Now, I say supposedly Columbia, because we're going to see another picture of Wallace in a minute. It's going to raise the Yale question. You know, did he go to Columbia? Did he go to Yale? Interesting school, Columbia. We got a guy in the White House right now says he went to Columbia, yet not one single person who went there at the same time ever remembers even seeing him there, including his teachers. Wallace meets Johnson in 1950, and in 1951, through the Department of Agriculture, by the way, and in 1951, he starts killing people for him. See, at this time, <clears throat> Lyndon Johnson's got a little bit of a problem. He's got this party girl sister named Josepha, who he later has killed. And um, she's a sometimes hooker, she's a bisexual, she loves drinking, she loves drugs, and she's got a big, fat mouth. And she's also banging this guy named John Douglas Kinzer. And Kinzer's stooping Malcolm Wallace's wife. So you see, this story's not going to have a happy ending for somebody. So one day Wallace hops in his car and he drives out to the greater DC, from the greater DC area, to outside of Austin, Texas. Pulls up into the parking lot of the Butler Park Pitch and Putt Golf Pro Shop. Say that five times fast. He walks into the joint, he sees Kinzer there, pulls out a gun and blows him away in broad daylight. Hops in his car and drives away. Now the cops catch him literally within minutes. He's got Virginia plates on his car. There's an eyewitness seeing him fleeing the crime scene. And when the cops pull the car over, he rolls a window down his car. He says, you can't arrest me. I work for Senator Lyndon Johnson. Well, they just pull him out of the car. They cuff him. They stuff him. They throw him in the jail. And he's going to go on trial for murder. During the trial, Lyndon Johnson rents a hotel room down the street from the courthouse. He's got runners going back and forth. He's got his top lawyer working on this guy. But Malcolm Wallace is convicted of murder. You want to know what his sentence was? Five years suspended. Five years suspended sentence for a murder conviction in the state of Texas. I'm just going to let that sink in for a minute. <laughs> Every single other person convicted of murder that year got the death penalty in Wallace Watts. Oh, by the way, the judge was a guy named Obetz. And he's a big Lyndon Johnson supporter. Surprise, surprise. But you didn't see that happening. Wallace walks. And not only does Wallace walk, he walks into a brand new job, too. He starts working in aerospace, where he needs a secret clearance to work. I want one person on this planet to sit me down and explain to me how a convicted murderer can get a secret, that kind of security clearance. How does that work? I want to have a couple of beers with that person. Gets better. Strap your seatbelts now because uh, it's going to get real bumpy. That's Malcolm Wallace's fingerprint. It was found on a cardboard box on the sixth floor of the Texas School Book Depository Building, where we're told Lee Harvey Oswald did that miracle shooting job from. Six people describe someone who looks like Malcolm Wallace in that window, not someone who looked like Lee Harvey Oswald. One of the witnesses was a guy named Richard Carr. And Richard Carr says he sees the same guy running in, he, he describes Wallace to a T, by the way, including the style of horn rimmed glasses that he was wearing. Says he sees the same guy running out of a side door, hopping into a car, and driving away shortly after the murder. Be a good, being a good citizen and all, he tells the Dallas Police Department. And Dallas Police Department now reporting everything to the FBI. In fact, they're going to be packing up all their evidence and shipping it off to the FBI. Where Lyndon Johnson's best friend and next door neighbor for years, J. Edgar Hoover, is going to be running the show. Over the next several years, Mr. Carr had no less than four attempted assassinations on his wife. By knife, by gunfire, and someone trying to put a bomb in his car. He survived all. Malcolm Wallace himself was killed in a freak single accident car crash in his home state of Texas in 1971. He drives his pickup truck right off the road one night. Now Malcolm Wallace was an extremely heavy drinker his entire adult life and he often drove drunk. But somebody out there must have really not wanted Wallace to come home that night because his pickup truck was rigged so that the carbon monoxide goes into the truck cabin. And Malcolm Wallace will not be down for breakfast. Here's another picture of Wallace right here. Anybody recognize his character standing next to him? Bush. That's George Bush Sr. This is why I mentioned Yale, because this is a Skull and Bones meeting. And Skull and Bones is a semi-secret society on the Yale campus. 
They got more than a dozen of these things here. There's scroll and key, there's wolf's head, you can look them all up. But skull and bones is a real powerful one. So it kind of looks to me like Wallace went to Yale, not Columbia. I mean, that's Wallace and that's Bush. This is William F. Buckley, too, another CIA prick. So, <clears throat> you know that George Bush Sr. said for over 30 years he couldn't remember what he was doing or where he was when Kennedy was killed? Just had no recollection of the day. Then all of a sudden, about 10 or 15 years ago, he starts to remember. Miracle of miracles. He remembers where he was, he remembers making this phone call. Well, I don't believe he believed a word out of his mouth. Because I'm 100% convinced that's George Bush Sr. right there, standing in front of the Texas School Book Depository building within minutes of Kennedy's head coming apart. And put this one in your pocket, <coughs> he was picked up as a suspect in the murder. Do you know that? Sheriff Department scooped him and a couple other guys up and questioned him. Now they let him go pretty quick, saying that, well, we have a Texas oil man in custody. And they let him go. By the way, if you want to know what George Bush Jr. was doing that day, He's wandering around the Daily Plaza too. He's all 17 years old in this picture. He's got the same stupid look he has on his face when he's in the White House. Some things never change. This character right here is a guy named D. Was was a guy named D. H. Bird, and D. H. Bird was another Texas oil tycoon. You guys see a pattern forming here at all? A D.H. Bird helped to form an organization out there that was called the Civil Air Patrol. And names that pop up in this Kennedy thing, some of these guys were members of the Civil Air Patrol. Guys like David Ferry, Charles Frederick Rogers, and a name you might be just a wee familiar with, Lee Harvey Oswald. D.H. Bird also owned a company called Temco, and they made aircraft parts and stuff like that. And they later merged with two other companies to form Ling Temco Watt, an aerospace company. And that's the aerospace company Malcolm Wallace went to go work for days after his murder conviction. And D.H. Bird owned a building. Anybody here want to take a wild, uneducated guess what building he owned? <laughs> Texas School Book Depository building. He owned the building. Oswald only been working there a few weeks. And when D.H. Bird hears that the president supposedly was shot from this particular window, he sends a construction crew into the building, they pull the window frame out, and he puts it in his house as a trophy. Hollywood screenwriters can't write this stuff. If you put that in a movie, nobody would believe it. And by the way, you're never going to see any of this on the History Channel. You're never going to see any more history on the History Channel either. That's another rant. Well, we do have to talk about this guy a little bit. He actually was there, although I don't believe he had a freaking thing to do with shooting anybody that day. This is, of course, Lee Harvey Oswald. This picture was taken right after his arrest in Dallas. Oswald's got a little bit of a strange background himself. His pops had passed away about a month or a month and a half before he's born. And as he grows up, his mother likes to date mafia guys. In fact, Oswald is from a hooked up family. His uncle Dutz, a guy named Charles Dutz Morant, is a lieutenant in Carlos Marcello's outfit. And Carlos Marcello is the head of the New Orleans Mafia. He's also one of the most powerful Mafia guys that's in the history of this country, and almost no one has ever heard of him. Well, either that or he's just a tomato salesman, like he said he was. Yeah, one or the other. Oswald moves around a lot as a kid, school to school, place to place, even spends some time in New York City. When he's 15 years old, he's living back in the South, where he joins the Civil Air Patrol. And then here he meets lifelong friend, or rather associate, David Ferry. We'll talk about him in a minute. When Oswald's 17, he joins the United States Marine Corps. And upon induction, he tried to join when he was 16, but they just wouldn't let him in yet. When he gets into the Marine Corps, all of a sudden he starts speaking Russian, and he becomes in love and enthralled with Marxism. Because the United States Marines do that stuff all the time, right? <laughs> One of Oswald's jobs in the Marine Corps is he's stationed in Atsuki, Japan, monitoring U-2 spy plane activity, something he needs a top secret clearance to do. And of course, they're going to hand this to some guy spouting Marxist-Leninist philosophy. No problem here. And right after he defects to Russia, we'll talk about that in a second, Gary Powers' U-2 spy plane is shot down over Russia. Another coincidence. Now, when Russia, when, when Oswald gets out of the Marine Corps and he gets out early, 
He makes that big announcement. Hey, everybody, I'm going to defect to the Soviet Union. With all of 320 some odd dollars to his name, he gets transportation to Helsinki, Finland, where he promptly checks himself into a five-star hotel. I mean, this, this joint was so swank it had its own newspaper. So who's paying for this? Now, Oswald does move down the street a short time later to a four-star hotel. Doesn't want to draw too much you know, heat on him, I guess. Where he spends the next couple, several days hitting the Russian embassy, begging to be let into the Soviet Union. After a botched suicide attempt, the Russians let him in. When he gets into the Soviet Union, he actually does pretty well. People seem surprised that his Russian's as good as it is. He gets a job at a radio factory. He's getting money from the Red Cross. That's never been explained. At least not to me, anyway. He meets people. He meets girls. He meets one girl named Marina. And after only knowing her for five to six weeks, they're married. Marina had previously dated another American defector. What are the odds of that? Another coincidence. Her uncle's high-level military intelligence. And he thinks, this is a fantastic idea. Yeah, get married to this guy. After Marina gets, gives birth to a baby girl, the Oswalds decide, you know, we really don't like living here in the Soviet Union. Hey, baby, let's move back to the United States. Now, how the hell Marina gets out of that country is anyone's guess. I mean, this is at the height of the Cold War. They don't call the Soviet Union an Iron Curtain country for nothing. Oswald himself doesn't have a pot to piss in. Now he's, he's got to move three people back to the United States. How's he get the cash? The State Department loans him the money. That's the United States State Department loans him the money. He comes back on a military transport. Hollywood screenwriters can't write this shit. When Marina gets in, when he gets into the country, he's just brief, briefly questioned by the FBI. But they don't follow him around and hassle him, give him grief. I mean, the FBI is famous for that. The Marine Corps never comes after Oswald. They don't question him once. When Marina gets into the country and in record time, she's never hassled by immigration. Again, height of the Cold War. The Oswalds bounce around between Texas and Louisiana, finally ending up in Dallas. Every single one of Oswald's buddies, he's got a cast of characters, he's hanging out with himself. They're all connected to the CIA, the Mafia, or both. Yes, there's a couple more seats over there somewhere. Really? Okay. Marina's expecting another baby, and they're also and the Oswalds are having serious, serious marital problems, including acts of domestic violence. Marina moves in with this couple, Ruth and Michael Payne, both CIA operatives, although they both deny it to this day. They're both still alive, as far as I know. Now I just. I just got distracted, so I kind of lost my train of thought here. So Marina's moving with this couple, Ruth and Michael Payne. Ruth Payne just happens to be juiced into the local Russian community. And she also helps Oswald get the job at that book building. That's pretty nice of her, isn't it? Michael Payne works for Bell Helicopter, where he needs a top secret clearance to work. Now he's got a Russian woman living in his house who's married to a Marxist Leninist who had defected to the Soviet Union in the middle of the Cold War, and he doesn't lose his top secret clearance? Who the hell's handing out all these top secret clearances? That's what I want to know. Then we're told by our news media, by our government, one day Oswald decides he's going to order the world. By the way, Oswald's living across town in a boarding house at this time, so they're not living together. He's going to order the world's crappiest produced shoulder weapon of the 20th century. An Italian bolt action, manly Carcano, piece of World War II surplus junk. I mean, this gun is such a piece of junk that even when it was in use by the Italian army, it was nicknamed the humane weapon. Because past 50 yards, it was so inaccurate, you couldn't hit anything with it. So Oswald orders this gun using a phony name, and of course, it's delivered right to his P.O. box address. The money order used to buy this gun is never cashed. That's my favorite part. One day, Oswald takes his gun apart. He decides he's just going to kill the president because he's got nothing better else to do, right? Takes the gun apart, wraps it up in some papers from work, gets it to that book building. Gets up to the sixth floor, where we're told by the FBI that he puts that thing together using a coin, and then proceeds to shoot the president with bullets that defy the laws of physics. Then he stashes his gun after wiping all of his fingerprints off of it, makes it past the staircase, past two people who apparently just don't see him. 
where he's seen less than 90 seconds later in a break room, leaning up against the soda machine, sipping on a soda as cool as a cucumber. Then we're told, ah, now Oswald's gonna panic. He's gonna flee across town and hide out in the movie theater. Yeah. He takes the most bizarre zigzagging route you ever even heard to be to get there. He's on a bus, he's in a taxi, he's on foot. We're told he stops off at his house. And we're told along the way he meets a police officer, J.D. Tippett. Where Oswald proceeds to take out a 38 special caliber handgun that had a bent firing pin that couldn't fire and proceed and shoot and kill Tippett with said weapon. And because he's got all the time in the world, he stands there like a retard opening up the cylinders of his gun and empty out shell casings onto the crime scene by two different manufacturers. Then he takes off a jacket that he wasn't wearing and he leaves that at the crime scene. And here's my favorite part. He pulls his wallet out and he leaves that at the crime scene. <laughs> Remember, he leaves his wallet to tip and shoot him, so we're going to get back to his wallet. It's a magical wallet. <laughs> then he flees into the movie theater about a half mile away, and despite the fact that he was already in the movie theater when the tip and shooting goes down, is irrelevant to the official story. We don't even know about that. Little details. We're told Dallas Police Department one day gets a telephone call. One day, that day, gets a telephone call. Somebody just ran into a movie theater left buying a ticket. The president's just been shot. The governor's just been shot. Police officer's just been shot. What's that? Someone didn't buy a ticket to the movie theater. Let's roll, boys. <laughs> Click. <laughs> fifteen, fifteen freaking police cars roll in that crime scene, man. And when the cops get there, there's already people who identify themselves as CIA and FBI. What were they sitting there on the police scanner waiting for this hot tip? The cops go in, they arrest Oswald after a scuffle. And when he's taken into custody, and he gets to that police station, Oswald denies doing anything. Remember, one of the reasons we're told that Oswald killed the president is because he wanted to become famous. Well, what do you do when you want to become famous? You tell everybody, hey, everybody, I did it. Oswald denies it, says he's just a patsy, says he's, which means he's being set up. Not only that, the cops don't know exactly who they got here. And why is that? Because they found his wallet in his pocket. So now we got two wallets, and in there are two separate IDs, one that says Alex J. Heidel, the other one Lee Harvey Oswald. And when the cops ask him, hey, which one of these guys are you? He says, oh, you're the police. You figure it out. It takes the cops two hours to ID Oswald. Yet within 40 minutes of Oswald's arrest, J. Edgar Hoover's on the phone to Bobby Kennedy. We got our man in Dallas. He's a communist, and he's a nut. Now, I'm paraphrasing what Hoover said, but he did use those two words, communist and nut. So here, J. Edgar Hoover's got the whole thing down. The cops don't even know who they got. The cops interrogate Oswald, and then they destroy their notes. Because cops do that all the time, too. Well, nowadays they probably do. And they beat the crap out of Oswald when he's in custody, or somebody does. And in less than 48 hours later, Lee Harvey Oswald's little parking garage is going to be transported to a jail there in the city. And his buddy, since he's known before he was a teenager, Jack Ruby, walks up and shoots Lee Harvey Oswald live on television, giving the American public their first televised murder. Oswald dies a short time later in Parkland Hospital. Now, I already spent kind of way too much time on Oswald, but I'm going to hit a couple other quick notes here before we move to Oswald's buddies. Uh, Oswald failed the nitrate test showing that he didn't fire a rifle that day. I think that probably would have got him thrown out of a court case immediately. No fingerprints were found on that gun when the FBI first looks at it. They look at it a second time after he's dead, they find a palm print, and it's Oswald's. Only two shell casings were found up in that book building when the cops get there. Days later, a, another police officer pulls an empty shell casing out of his pocket. And he goes, well, I've been carrying this around for a few days. He puts it in the evidence drawer, giving reinforcement to the so-called three shots. And I got big news for you. There was a minimum of eight shots fired that day, possibly as many as 12. You had bullets whizzing around all, all over there in Daly Plaza. And last, and definitely not least, here's a picture of Lee Harvey Oswald right there. Standing in, front of, standing in the opening of the doorway as the president's car is driving by. Here's a blow-up of this. Uh, this photo array was put together by another researcher named Richard Hook, who I really think is fantastic. And you should friend him on Facebook if you like this kind of stuff. He's got a 50-point match to Oswald in that doorway. 50-point match. Well, if Oswald's in the doorway, he ain't in the window. Let's look at some of Oswald's buddies. Each one of these guys is weirder than the next. This first character right here is a guy named George de Mornschild. 
And I'm 100% convinced that this is one of Oswald's handlers. I think he had another handler named David Athey Phillips, but you're just going to have to look him up all on your own. De Mornschild's an interesting guy. He's born in Russia. He's actually a, from an aristocratic family. He moves to the United States at a very young age. He had worked for Army Intelligence during World War II, but there's a little controversy about the Mornschild because there were some people during the war not 100% sure what team he's rooting for. The Mornschild is also a white Russian, which means hanging out with Oswald is a little bit of a problem. Now, not white in the color of his skin, but white in the color of his politics. He's pro czar and very vocal about it. We're told Lee Harvey Oswald is a Marxist Leninist, which would make him a red. Whites and reds don't hang out. Okay, it's not like in the United States where he's a conservative, he's a liberal, and they disagree from time to time. No. Get a violent overthrow of the Russian. Uh, the Russian uh, government there, the Bolshevik Revolution killed God knows how many people. They slaughtered the imperial family. Whites and reds are not going to hang out. That'd be the equivalent of a guy who's black and he's palling around with the uh, local, the um, exalted cyclops from the local chapter, the Ku Klux Klan. Okay, it's not going to happen, ever. But we're told this is Lee Harvey Oswald's best friend up until he dies. De Mortschild not only knows Oswald, he knows Ruth and Michael Payne, where Marina stayed. <clears throat> he had once worked for Texas oil tycoon D.H. Byrd. He's good buddies with Abraham Zabruder, the guy that took the so-called Zabruder film, which I can prove in 20 minutes has been heavily doctored, if not a complete fabricated hoax from whole cloth. But that's another speech. Maybe I'll do that one next time. <clears throat> George Newmornshield had once dated Jackie Kennedy's mother. Jackie Kennedy had referred to him as Uncle George. He started an organization that Jackie Kennedy became a volunteer member of before she was married, when her last name was still Bouvier. He's good buddies with Oleg Cassini, and that's Jackie Kennedy's personal dressmaker. He knows over 20 people connected directly to the CIA, including his personal friend and buddy that he's known for years, George Bush Sr. Now, De Mornschild supposedly was not in Dallas that day. There's rumors that he was. Official story is he's hanging out with another one of his pals, and that's Papa Doc Dubolier from Haiti, that he's staying at his personal residence during the time of the assassination. Now, years after all this Kennedy stuff blows over, we're told in the 1970s that people get interested, that some people in our Congress get interested in some of this assassination stuff. Remember, Martin Luther King Jr. is killed, and so is Bobby Kennedy. They want to get to the bottom of it. They want to get to the bottom of the CIA mafia connection. Some committees are formed. You have the Church Committee, you got the House Select Committee on Assassinations, and you got the Rockefeller Committee. Now, it's my personal belief these committees were either co-opted quickly after starting, or they were snow jobs from day one. Because there's a lot of murders that take place and during these committees, and De Mornschild's no exception to that rule. Because the day before he's supposed to testify, we're told he takes a shotgun to, to his head and blows his brains out. There's evidence someone was in the room with him when this happened. I personally believe he was murdered. Besides, in fact, his wife said he didn't even like guns. Here's a picture of Jim Warnschild not looking too good. Shotgun placed conveniently at his feet, in my opinion. Right before he kills himself, he had written a heartfelt, gut-wrenching letter to his buddy, George Poppy Bush Sr saying that the CIA had been hassling him and his wife. They're scaring the heck out of her. Bush does nothing, and De Mornschild is conveniently dead. This character right here is far and beyond the most bizarre character in this entire menagerie. I mean, this, this guy is out there. This is David Ferry. David Ferry was an Ohio native from the greater Cleveland area. And... Um, he was also an extremely devout Catholic, and at a very young age, he wants to become a Catholic priest. So he goes to two different seminary schools, and he goes to some other institutions of learning in between. Uh, at the end, of, and to call David Ferry intelligence probably the understatement of the 20th century, because the guy's got an IQ that's totally out of control. By the time he's done with his studies, he speaks five modern languages fluently, plus ancient Greek and ancient Latin. He plays concert piano. There's probably not a subject matter when it comes to military history, theology, philosophy that David can't discuss with an expert level of knowledge. He gets a PhD in psychology, 
he becomes an expert in hypnotism. And one day he wants to learn how to fly airplanes. So he goes and he takes pilot training, and he's brilliant at that too. He leaves or he's thrown out of the last seminary school to become a pilot full time, soon getting a job at Eastern Airlines. Somewhere along the way, he had also joined the Civil Air Patrol, where he meets the 15 year old Lee Harvey Oswald. And for years, there were people that said, Oh, he never met Oswald in the Civil Air Patrol. That's all that conspiracy theory stuff. Well, the people that said that had to shut up. Because when this picture came out a few years ago, that's Ferry, that's Oswald. End of story. Yes, they knew each other. And you would think a guy like David Ferry, who could do all this super amazing stuff, would have the world by the palm of his, and just in the palm of his hand. But unfortunately, David Ferry's got two small problems. Problem number one, he loses all of his body hair, just falls off, it's a weird condition. And uh, I actually worked with a guy when I was in advertising when I was a kid in my 20s. This happened to him. Very, very strange. So David Ferry gets into the habit of wearing these glue-on eyebrows and these wigs. It gives him a very bizarre appearance. And the older Ferry gets, the weirder he looks. Ferry's other small problem, well, he likes having sex with teenage boys. Eastern Airlines gets a hold of this information and they bounce Ferry in a New York minute. He's gone. And Ferry had also kind of one time stolen a plane with one of his little boy toys in it and they buzzed the city of New Orleans together. And when he lands the plane, the FAA and the kid's parents are waiting for him at the bottom of the runway. So I'm not saying he didn't deserve to get fired, he did. But Ferry flips out a little bit. He spends a lot of time, money, and attention trying to get that job back, but he never does. But Ferry is no thumb twiddler. What does he do? He starts flying missions into Cuba. Counterfeit money, radio equipment, all sorts of crazy stuff. And he's training other people to do the same thing. To land and take off these small airplanes onto these makeshift runways and beachheads. He also becomes the full, the, uh, not full time pilot, but the personal pilot for Mafia mob boss out of New Orleans, Carlos Marcello, where Ferry has an apartment. Also in this apartment, he has a makeshift lab where he's working on a cancer research project. He's working on an MK Ultra mind control experiment for the CIA, or at least he's got the paperwork on it. And Ferry starts studying voodoo. Hmm. I told you, man, he is out there. Now, David Ferry was not in Dallas that day. Um, I'm 90% convinced that Carlos Marcello was at that Murkison meeting the night before, which meant David Ferry would have flown him in. David was probably not at the meeting, but he's probably waiting at the airport to pick him up and take him back. The day of the assassination, David Ferry and Carlos Marcello are sitting in a courtroom in Louisiana during one of uh, Marcello's many deportation hearings. He was of Sicilian ancestry, but he was born in Tunisia and for some stupid reason never became a U.S. citizen. So the country tried to throw him out for years, but his battery of lawyers kept him off his back. So, so sitting in that courtroom. But David Ferry had taken a car and driven it into Texas and back that weekend. This comes to the attention of Jim Garrison, the uh, district of attorney out of New Orleans. Uh, if you watch the movie JFK, you'll see this at the beginning of the film, and uh, it's a Joe Pesci plays a David Ferry character. So he calls him in to give a statement. Ferry gives him this cockamamie story about goose hunting and ice skating. And he's getting weirder and weirder. He's more and more nervous. He's sucking cigarettes down like they're Halloween candy. And Garrison doesn't believe a word out of his mouth and has him detained. Well, what he does is he turns him over to the FBI, he lies his ass off to them, and they just let him dance away. It's a felony to lie to the FBI. You do that, you're going to go to jail. Ferry walks. Now, over the years, Garrison gets very interested in this Kennedy thing. He starts digging into the crime. First, he starts thinking Oswald had help. Then he starts thinking Oswald didn't do anything at all, that he was set up just like he said he was. A newspaper article comes out in 1967 about Garrison's investigation, and David Ferry's name is right there in that newspaper article. Ferry calls him up on the phone, screaming at the top of his lungs, they're going to kill me, they're going to kill me, they're going to kill me. And five days later, David Ferry's found dead in the park. Here's a picture of Ferry not looking too good. And look at that, he's got his get-up line in bed. Every single person knew David Ferry said he took that stuff off the second he walked in the apartment. It's not going to wear the bed. There's two unsigned type suicide notes found in David Ferry's apartment. Empty bottle of medicine laying there. Autopsy reports that the inside of his mouth was cut up like someone forced his mouth open. And that bottle of medicine is proloid. He 
You take a handful of two proloid pills and you're going to die of a brain aneurysm. I don't care what anybody says. Fairy was murdered. Plain and simple. Very tragic life day. This character ain't looking too good in this picture, neither. This is also post-mortem. This is a guy named Eladio Del Valle. And this was David Ferry's paymaster when he's flying his little missions into Cuba. Uh, even though he's all the way out there in Florida, somebody or a group of somebody jumps him when he's in his car, takes a hatchet, chops his head up. In fact, I think the hatchet was still found stuck in a guy's head when the cops find the body. And someone taking a handgun and pumped a bunch of bullets into his chest. So, there are some people out there that think Eladio Del Valle was in Dallas that day and he was part of a shooting team. Now, I don't know, but there's people out there that do, so he's definitely worth being mentioned here. This is your favorite person, right? Yeah. I'll pass on it. This character right here is a guy named Guy, was a guy named Guy Bannister. Guy Bannister was an ex-FBI guy out of Chicago. Well, who knows if he was an ex-FBI guy out of Chicago? But he was out of Chicago and living in New Orleans at the time and had like a private investigating service kind of thing going. And uh, had an office in a building. Some people even called it the Bannister Building. Whole upstairs was filled full of weapons and equipment going into Cuba. He was heavily involved in that kind of injury. Now, Bannister was not in Dallas that day, but he's tied to Ferry and Oswald directly. And we know that because both of them were seen in his office together and separately. His assistant, Jack Martin, said David Ferry was there so, uh, so many times he practically lived there. And Oswald rents office space from Bannister. Again, another strange bedfellow thing because we're told Lee Harvey Oswald, Marxist Leninist, Guy Bannister's politics put him 56,000 miles to the right of Genghis Khan. <laughs> so, how are these two guys getting along? Now, not only is Bannister tied to the FBI, David Ferry, Lee Harvey Oswald, he's mobbed up to his eyeballs. He's got deep ties into the mafia, deep connections into the CIA, Office of Naval Intelligence, anti-Castro Cubans, and he knows Bobby Kennedy personally. Now, just a few months after uh, Kennedy's killed, Bannister's found lying dead naked in his bed. He's got his gun laying next to him because he always went to bed with his gun. A couple things. Yeah, a couple problems with this story, because his wife and his girlfriend, because he had both, they said that he never went to bed naked, he always wore pajamas. They also both said that there was a bullet in his back. Now the official cause of Bannister's death is heart attack. Although I don't know how anyone could say that with a straight face, because uh, no autopsy was ever performed. How can you have cause of death with that autopsy like that? What was he, scullied? That's what I'm thinking. I mean, the amount of convenience sloppiness in some of this Kennedy stuff is beyond the pale. It really is. This character right here was a guy named Clay Shaw. Clay Shaw was the only person ever to be held for trial with this Kennedy thing. Uh, he was found not guilty. Again, if you watch the movie JFK, you'll see this at the end of the film. I think it's Tommy Lee Jones plays the Clay Shaw character. Yeah. Clay Shaw, too, had worked for Army Intelligence during World War II. Weird. Weird military background because it included multiple names for Mr. Shaw. I mean, the guy wins an award from the country of France, of all places. And when he gets back to the United States, he soon starts working for the newly formed CIA. Now, CIA denied this for years. And then they came out just a few years ago, like five, seven years ago, and said, oh, yeah, Clay Shaw worked for us for years. Yeah, we knew that. And we knew that because Clay Shaw had been the head of an outfit called International Trademark. And, uh, long suspected to be a CIA front company. Clay Shaw is too is tied to an outfit called Permindex. And Permindex is a Mossad money laundering <coughs> organization. And here's another way Permindex works. Let's say you're some kind of spook character or assistant spook character running around down there. You're shuttling people around, you're making phony IDs, maybe you're running a safe house on Holland Avenue in Dallas, Texas, who knows? You're not going to get a check in the mail every payday that says CIA on it. No, what you're going to do is you're going to go to Guy Bannister's office, because he was tied to Bannister too, and you're just going to hand you a Permindex pay voucher, you're going to sign it, hand it to a secretary, Delphine, and she pays you in cash. That's how that worked. Or one of the ways that worked. The bartender? Getting the bartender paid the cash. And they just put it right back again. Okay. The bartender paid cash. 
Was that was that cats and jammers? Yeah. Okay. 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 So we got that straightened out. Clay Shaw too was not in Dallas that day, as far as I know, but he too was tied to Ferry and Oswald directly, and we know that because all three of them were seen in Clinton, Louisiana, standing in front of a payphone for over an hour, right in the middle of a black voter registration rally. So here you got these three far out white dudes hanging out with all these black people to the point where a sheriff comes over and wants to know what the heck they're doing there. Talk about racial profile. And that's when Clay Shaw was ID. Yeah, so we know that they, they do there. So Clay Shaw was also gay and him and David Ferry had interesting parties together. And I have an eyewitness that puts Clay Shaw and David Ferry's apartment on New on uh, Halloween Eve, right before Kennedy's killed, whooping it up with a bunch of uh, other unusual New Orleans characters. And according to him, they were all in these weird costumes, and there was a bunch of drunken, naked teenage boys running around the place. And to quote him, I tried to get the hell out of that homo party as fast as possible. <laughs> Clay Shaw, too, also dies in about, it was about 1975. Official cause of death is lung cancer. He was a fairly heavy smoker. But his, his death, too, has weird stuff involved in it. So what's he taken out? I don't know, but usually when there's smoke, there's fire with this Kennedy thing. Unintended. This is Jack Ruby. Jack Ruby is the guy that gives the American public their first televised murder. His real name is Jacob Rubenstein, a nice Jewish boy from Chicago. Had mob ties his entire life. Uh, basically, when he's a kid, he's working for Al Capone's outfit. And he, too, had ran, like, uh, missions into Cuba. Definitely uh, guns, possibly drugs, possibly um, money, currency. And uh, his best friend was a guy named Louis McWilly. And Louis McWilly was Santo Traficante's number one guy in Havana. And Santo Traficante is the mob boss of Miami. In fact, it was Jack Ruby that went and got Traficante out of jail when Castro had him thrown in there. And it was also Traficante who set up a nice little multi-girl orgy for then-Senator JFK to, uh, when he went into Cuba and had a little party with these five or six chicks in this thing. And uh, Traficante had set that up for him. So that was pretty nice. Jack Ruby had also been a, 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 an informant for a popular American politician. And that politician's name was Richard Milhouse Nixon. The politician that introduces Ruby to Nixon is Lyndon Johnson. Is this getting weird enough for everybody here? Now, in 1963, Ruby's running a nightclub called The Carousel, where Lee Harvey Oswald and David Ferry were both seen chatting with Ruby. In fact, <clears throat> Ruby had known Oswald since before he was a teenager, when he was a kid. Remember, his mother's date mafia guys. Now, she never met, she never dated Ruby, and Ruby was a low-level guy, but it's an exclusive club. Everyone knows each other. That carousel, that, and Ruby and Oswald have been seen eating breakfast together on more than one occasion. And this, uh, also this um, uh, joint that he owns is part of like a chain of club, nightclubs that are owned throughout the, the southeast, all the way to, from Texas into Florida. And they're controlled by the mob. And a lot of the comedians and dancers and some of the entertainment used to kind of travel around in a circuit with these clubs. It's also a huge cop hang. Ruby literally knew the, the names of over 200 Dallas police officers. Knew their name. You tell me how a guy like Jack Ruby is able to smuggle a gun past 75 armed police officers to shoot the most famous person in U.S. custody live on television if he doesn't have cop help. Doesn't make any sense. Exactly. Uh, here's Ruby shooting Oswald, very famous picture. Here's this guy in this white don't shoot me costume. <laughs> the guy claimed that he didn't have a dark suit, which turns out to be a complete lie. And does anybody else notice anything interesting about this? Ruby's pulling, the, Ruby's pulling the trigger with no finger. That's an assassination technique. Nobody on the planet reaches into their pocket, pulls a gun out, and shoots like that. Ruby was trained to do that. You line your human beings have the uncanny ability to point with extreme accuracy, and you line your finger with a pistol. Against the stub, with a stubby pistol against the barrel, I should say, and pull it with your middle finger, you're going to hit anything you're pointing at. How do you know that? How do I know that? The Joker. We'll talk to that later. <laughs> <laughs> now, who taught Ruby how to do this? I don't know, but somebody did. Now, Ruby's, of course, arrested right there on the spot, claims he shot 
uh, Oswald had some twisted patriotic loyalty to Jackie Kennedy. He's thrown into jail, and Oswald, I mean, Oswald, Ruby spends the next three years begging to be taken to Washington, D.C. He says, I got a big story to tell. No one's going to know exactly what I did or what happened until I tell my story in D.C. But he's never taken there. One day someone comes in, they give him an injection, and he just starts screaming in jail. He's just been injected with cancer. And several weeks later, Jack Ruby dies of an extremely aggressive form of cancer. Okay, technically he didn't die of the cancer. Okay, I gotta say this for someone out there who's gonna bang me on it, rightfully so. He died of a blood clot, but it was during one of his cancer treatment, uh, uh, whatever, what was going on. So he was being treated for the disease. Interesting, we're gonna get back to this cancer thing too. This is Dorothy Kilgallen. I mentioned her briefly, not that she was in Dallas that day. She just happened to be the only news reporter to want to interview Jack Ruby. Think about that. One news reporter wants to go and interview Jack Ruby. It should have been a line around the block. And she was a, like a celebrity news reporter. Uh, she had a very popular column read by millions of Americans. She um, uh, also had been on television. Frank Sinatra didn't like her very much because she always talked about the scandals he was involved in. And he wasn't too happy with her. But uh, she goes in, interviews Jack Ruby, and when she gets out, she said, I'm going to blow the lid off this Kennedy thing. And by the way, she was a real news reporter, too. She was very aggressive and very intelligent. Not like these talking dildos we have on television today, <laughs> these wannabe actors that wouldn't know a news reporter that jumped up and bit them. So she makes this big announcement. Weeks later, she's found dead in her New York apartment. So was that after she met Mae Brussels? That's after she met Mae Brussels? Okay, I didn't know that. Yeah. Now, did she meet her or just talk to her? She went out and talked to her, and she came back. It was two days later that she was dead. Oh. Okay, interesting. Yeah, I didn't know she that. She Apparently, she missed Mae Brussels. Oh. Yeah. The conspiracy lady in the oh. 70s. Yeah. Who had more information on everything than ancient Rome for today. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, she's found laying dead in a bed she never slept in, because it was a guest room. She's reading a book that she'd previously read. It also happens to be upside down. Her reading glasses that she needed to read that book are nowhere to be found in the room. Official cause of death is a accidental overdose of barbiturates and alcohol. Of the three different barbiturates found in her system, only one can be found in her medicine cabinet. Oh, and she's laying in bed with all her makeup on. Because, ladies, you go to bed with all your makeup on all the time, right? Yeah. The um, notes and recordings that she had taken uh, during the Ruby interview were never found. In fact, her estranged husband had made some cryptic comment one time that these things never would be found. So I wonder what he knew. I don't know. This is a Judith Mary Baker. She's still alive. This was Lee Harvey Oswald's girlfriend for a short time when he was living in New Orleans when he comes back from, uh, uh, from the Soviet Union. They were two kids. They both had rotten marriages, and they were going to kind of run away together, and it never really happened. But she is a brilliant, brilliant woman. She was doing cancer research all by herself in high school. Right after high school, she comes to the attention of a Dr. Alton Ochsner, who says, hey, come out to New Orleans. She's in Florida at the time. And you worked on this little cancer research project that I got going on, and I'm going to fast track you into medical school. That's a pretty good idea. So she comes out, she meets David Ferry, she meets Lee Harvey Oswald, and this cancer research is taking place in the makeshift lab in David Ferry's apartment. She also finds out they're not working on any kind of cure or nothing, they're making a bioweapon out of it. And they're going to give it to Fidel Castro and the likes of him to try to knock him off. She also finds out that they're testing this on prisoners. At least two prisoners died with this cancer thing. And she freaks out. What was her name? Judith Barry Baker. Yeah. And she, uh, she writes a scathing note to Dr. Alton Ochsner and says, this is immoral. We can't be doing this stuff. We can't be killing people. Well, Ochsner gets this letter, and he flips out. And he threatens her and fires her immediately. Shortly after this, the president's killed. Oswald is killed. She starts melting down. Can you blame her? David Ferry calls her up on telephone and says, you got to shut up about any of this stuff. Don't talk to anyone. Don't tell your family anything. And you got to become a vanilla girl. That's what he told her. 
Now, she's had more assassination attempts on her life, and um, she's had more death threats than I've had hot meals in the last year and a half. She doesn't live in the United States anymore. She lives in Northern Europe and Scandinavia and moves around. She's written two books on the subject, one called Me and Lee, and one called David Ferry, Mafia Pilot, and I recommend both. She's a controversial figure, but I support her. So we're filming this, so Judith, the, I got your back, baby. <laughs> this is Dr. Mary Sherman. She also was not in Dallas that day, but she was a doctor uh, who kind of stopped by David Ferry's place and made sure everything was up to snuff as far as medical procedures, they had the right equipment, that kind of stuff. She was very, very brilliant, and David Ferry actually had a lot of medical buddies. He knew technicians, doctors, surgeons, um, you name it. David Ferry had lots of medical friends, and she was one of them. Right before the Warren Commission comes out to investigate Kennedy's murder in New Orleans, she's killed in one of the most bizarre and freakish murders in the history of this country. Look her up. So these, these are David Ferry's, I mean, these are Lee Harvey Oswald's buddies. He knew every single one of these people. We're told that he was this loser who kind of wandered around, doesn't know what he's going to do, and then he shoots the president. For a loser, he's got some pretty, some pretty inter interesting buddies, don't you think? Let's look at some other people who were in Dallas that day. We've got these three characters wandering around. Kennedy buffs know these guys as the three tramps. These are three guys pulled off a railroad car, literally down the street from where Kennedy was killed. They were taken into police custody, they were questioned, and they were let go. But who were they? Oh, right before I get to that, see that? He's wearing a Ku Klux Klan symbol right there on his police uniform. That's pretty cool, isn't it? <laughs> if you were a cop in Dallas that day, if you wanted to make rank, it helped to be a, a Klan member or, or a John Birch Society member, and you would climb up the ladder a little faster than anybody else. This first character right here is a guy named Charles Frederick Rogers. Interesting boy. He uh, joined the Navy at a fairly young age. And uh, he was a pretty smart guy because one of the things he likes to do is study nuclear physics, something he got a degree in. Also, one person that knew Rogers told me personally that he was also a half-baked radio communication genius. He said there was absolutely nothing Rogers didn't know about radios. He said, oh, you could take two cardboard boxes together and make a radio out of it. That's how much he knew about radios. He had also been a member of the Civil Air Patrol, and he knew David Ferry. Him and David Ferry had been seen together multiple times. In 1956, he gets hooked up with the CIA. Now, what the heck is this guy with this kind of street cred doing sitting on a railroad car like a bum, hence the name The Three Tramps, as the cops pick these guys up? What's he doing? Well, let's keep going, see if we can't connect a couple dots. In 1965, Rogers does two interesting things. He takes a hammer and he kills his parents. He then disappears from the continental United States, never to officially be seen again. And in 1975, Rogers is declared legally dead. Now, what happened to Rogers? Rumors abound. I got one source said he was sent to Central and South America to become a tortured killer for CIA. I tend to lean towards that story myself. Another source says he's connected to the Iran-Contra scandal, and I have yet another source that says he eventually he was killed in Honduras. Some which all may or may not be true, I really don't know. Rogers just kind of rides off into the sunset for me. This character right here is going to look and sound familiar to most people in this room. This guy's name was Charles Harrelson. This is actor Woody Harrelson's father. Charles here was a very, very bad boy. He got involved with organized crime as a young guy. He was even a heroin trafficker for a while. And he was also a hitman for the mob. Uh, Woody Harrelson is on record as saying his father was a CIA-trained assassin. That's what he said. Now, we knew he was a killer because he actually was convicted of two separate murders and sentenced. One of the murders was that of a judge, yeah? You mentioned he was always a happy. He was always a happy guy? Uh, he was the life of everybody. And okay. Bar. All right. And you guys call him Frankenstein. Yeah, yeah right? Frankenstein and Killer. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> His nickname apparently was Frankenstein Killer and Frankenstein Head because he had some. He looked like Frankenstein in the book. Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> the way he killed the judge, 
is he shot him in the head with a rifle from over 100 yards away. Does that method of execution sound familiar to anybody in this room? Now, I have a source that says Harrelson and, and Rogers were a murder duo team, that they traveled around the United States and took murder contracts together. Well, here they're together filmed in 1963. Is that a coincidence? I don't think so. Last time Harrelson was arrested, he's coked up out of his mind. He's sitting in a house or some building that he was holed up in. The cops surrounded the joint, and he's screaming at him that he was in Dallas and that he helped to kill the president. Years later, a British television company comes into the, to the jail where he's at, films him where he denies <coughs> any involvement. Uh, he passed away in prison, I think, in 2007. It's not that long ago. This next character is a real interesting guy. This is Chauncey Marvin Holt. Chauncey Holt, by his own admittance, had between 25 and 30 different aliases, including the official CIA moniker, John Moon. Now, Chauncey had joined the Army Air Corps at a pretty young age, but he wasn't too keen on going to war, because when Pearl Harbor lights up, Chauncey goes AWOL. He gets involved with some young guys who had stolen a plane, not just a plane, a, a car, and Chauncey goes joyriding with them. They cross state lines, and they all get mad by the feds. Chauncey goes to a reformatory. In the reformatory, he meets a member of organized crime, and that guy later becomes an official member of the Licaboli crime family in the 1950s later on. When Chauncey gets out of the reformatory, he starts working for organized crime. And Chauncey turns out to be a freaking gold mine. He's a really good looking guy. He's got the gift of gab. He's brilliant with numbers. He's so good with numbers, he ends up doing bookworking and accounting for mob outfits for years. Years. He's uh, got natural artistic ability. This is a self-portrait. Chauncey painted that picture. So he's forging documents and doing fun stuff like that, making counterfeit items. He absorbs languages like a sponge, and he can fly a plane. Chauncey's so good at his job, he's later personally recruited and hired by Meyer Lansky to come and work for him. One of his gigs is he works out of an outfit occasionally called Lasco. Lasco is owned by Meyer Lansky and the CIA. And what do they do? They make badges for law enforcement. Hollywood screenwriters can't write this stuff. If you put it in a movie, no one would believe it. By Chauncey's own admission, he takes a handful of Secret Service badges that he cooked up, puts them in a bag with two gangsters, Chucky Nicoletti out of Chicago being one. They hop into a car and they drive to Dallas, Texas together. Years later, Chauncey's daughter takes a video camera and films him talking about his adventures there, where he admits to being one of the three tramps, admits to being involved. It's turned into a mini documentary, and nine days later, Chauncey Holt's dead. Some people think he was taken out. I don't know. It sounds a little fishy to me. Chauncey was also an assassin who trained other assassins. This is, again, according to his own daughter. And right before Chauncey had passed away, he'd become telephone buddies with a researcher out there, a guy named Jim Fetzer. And Chauncey had called him up late one night and said that when he was in Dallas that day, it looked like a hitman convention. He said he saw contract killers from all over the world. I have a source that said when he was there, it looked like a mob convention. He said he saw gangsters there from Miami, Chicago, and Las Vegas wandering around. We're told this is Chauncey Holt right here. I'm not 100% sure, but this is Lee Harvey Oswald in the background. Is this a coincidence too? Now this picture has become famous again because we're told that's Ted Cruz's father right there. <laughs> By the way, Ted Cruz's father was seen in a photograph watching Kennedy's head come, up, come apart, which to me shows prior knowledge. He's, he's living in New Orleans. Why is he going to drive all the way to Dallas, Texas just to get a glimpse of the president in a car? Very interesting. He was an anti castro Cuban. Here's one more picture of the three tramps wandering around. A lot of people think this whole incident was staged because these cops are not acting very cop-like. I mean, the president's been shot, the governor's been shot, the cops been shot, and these two okie-dokers are walking around like they're gonna go out squirrel hunting. And not to mention, these guys are not detained in any way, and a total stranger now is walking through the lineup. Or is he a total stranger? Because he's been identified. Is Major General Edward Lansdale. Edward Lansdale was involved in numerous political assassinations and government overthrows. 
At the end of World War II, he was involved in the capture and torture of a Japanese general. Well, they didn't torture the general, they tortured his aide. Into finding out where the Japanese had hidden all their stolen gold that they had ripped off before and during the war. And apparently much of this gold was recovered. It was shipped to over 100 banks all over the world and has been used to fund black operations for decades. You're not going to read this in your high school history book on World War II. Who knows if they even teach World War II in high school anymore. I don't know. <laughs> That's him. Here's a fun guy. Yeah. This character's name right here was E. Howard Hunt. E. Howard Hunt was a career CIA guy. Now, there's a lot of people out there that think E. Howard Hunt was that third tramp. If that's what you really believe, I'm not going to get an argument. Because I don't think it makes the story any better or any worse. Because Hunt was there. Admitted to being there. And Hunt was involved in every sort of CIA shenanigan you could possibly imagine. <clears throat> He made a deathbed confession to his son, St. John Hunt, who released it immediately, probably saving his life, and it lit up the internet like a Christmas tree. Guess how many mainstream news organizations talked about this subject? Zero. <laughs> One. Rolling Stone Magazine picked up the story. If you want to call Rolling Stone Magazine mainstream, <laughs> right? No, no Times, no Baltimore Sun, no Washington Post, nobody picked it up, no NBC, NSNBC, CBS, Fox. And all you little liberals out there that love your NPR, well, they sold you out, too. Coast to coast, coast to coast AM had him on there for three hours. John Hunt? Yeah, St. John? St. John Hunt. Yeah. He was a good interview, yeah. Yeah, he's been on the Opperman Report, and he's been on a couple other shows, too. He's, yeah, I like him. He knows how to spin the yarn. Yes. Uh, Mrs. Hunt was on the airplane flight 800. They killed her. Yeah. Yeah. They did. That's my mind. Yes. Now, Hunt was also, and on this interview that he had, or interview, this tape that he had left, he said, yes, there was a plot to kill the president. Yes, Lyndon Johnson was involved. Yes, he was involved. Yes, he was there. And he said the name of this thing was called The Big Event. I believe that's E. Howard Hunt right here in Daily Plaza. I'm 99% convinced that that's him. He was uh, famous for this exact kind of raincoat that he wore when he went out on his little operations in these types of hats. First one, I agree with you. You don't agree with that? That's the first one, I'll agree with you. Okay. Stop it. <laughs> Here's one of the gangsters we're going to talk about. This is Charles Chucky Nicoletti, a gangster out of Chicago. A career hitman was involved in at least two dozen murders, including the official, uh, including what was called the Eminem murders out of Chicago. Anybody ever here see the movie Casino? Remember when Joe Pesci puts that guy's head in the vice and he's cranking, he's screaming at him, you made me pop your eye out of here. Well, that really happened. He didn't talk about that. Pesci did in the movie. Yeah, but I say, Ferry did not talk about I know, Ferry did not talk about that. And by the way, this is, this is the only co coincidence in this whole thing. Joe Pesci's name comes up twice. <laughs> That's the only coincidence. <laughs> I believe, in this whole video. Well, anyway, in real life, uh, that murder didn't take place in Las Vegas like the movie made it out to be. It took place in Chicago. And Anthony Spilatro took Billy McCarthy's head, put it in a vice, and cranked it and popped his eye out. And um, Nicoletti supposedly was sitting there watching this whole thing go down, eating a plate of pasta. That's what a hardcore guy he was. <laughs> the Nicoletti, he too was in Dallas that day. There's a lot of people think that he was in the uh, Dow Tex building, which is where I believe George Bush was placed there to get a shooting team into the Dow Tex building. Nicoletti was seen in Dallas by people who knew who he was. And our government knew he was there because Nicoletti was called to testify before the House Select Committee on Assassinations. But before he could go, he's sitting in his car in the parking lot of the Golden Horn Restaurant in his home state of Illinois, I think it was North Lake, and somebody walks up and puts three bullets into his head. Ambulance comes to pick him up, takes him to the hospital where he's proclaimed dead, and someone forgot to shut the car off and his car lights on fire. Oops. Now, was this a mob thing? You know, was this a sign, a signal, or was it just a screw up? It was so unusual because if you if you read about a lot of these uh, Kennedy associated deaths, there's a lot of weird stuff involved with them. So I really couldn't say that Nicoletti didn't live too long. This is another gangster out of Chicago, Johnny Rosselli. Johnny Rosselli uh, was the first gangster hired by the CIA to kill Fidel Castro. Something that he agreed to do. By the 
away. Johnny Roselli is also thought to be involved in the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. As a young gangster, he goes to Los Angeles where he gets involved in the movie business. And uh, his job in Los Angeles is to get under all the labor unions under mob control. And he did a really good job of that, too. He was also involved in some legitimate movie stuff. He hooked up with a guy named Delbert Graham. And Delbert Graham was a cousin of Bill Graham. And Bill Graham owned all the land that Benny Siegel built that Flamingo Hotel on. And Delbert Graham was involved in circus performers and things like that. And so they used to make circus movies together, which were very popular in the 1950s. And again, Johnny Rosselli was also heavily involved in Las Vegas as well. He knew everybody practically in Las Vegas, from the owners of hotels down to low-level car dealers, entertainers and everything. And Rosselli was in Dallas that day. He was seen at a nightclub the night before. How actually long he stayed in Dallas, I have no idea. And people saw Johnny Rosselli on the street, and he was also seen for several hours in the uh, basement uh, lunchroom of Baylor um, a Hospital on a bank of telephones. Johnny Rosselli, too, was called to testify before the House Select Committee on Assassinations. Now, he had done so twice before. The last time he goes, doesn't quite make it. He takes a pit stop in Florida, where he's found where he disappears. And weeks later, he's found stuffed into a 55-gallon drum floating off the coast of, I think it's pronounced Bisqueen Bay, off of Florida. He had been stabbed, he'd been strangled, and they chopped his legs off and stuffed them in the barrel. So these mobsters don't have very good retirement programs. <laughs> okay? I best not to get involved. So this is the last guy we're going to talk about here. Uh, this is a mob boss out of Chicago, Sam Momo Giancana. Giancana, too, was uh, uh, thought to be involved in the St. Valentine's Day Massacre as a uh, driver and a shooter. Giancana is another psychopath, and I use the term a lot, but Giancana was the real deal. He had failed a, um, an exam once where the government had stamped psychopath on a papers that kept him out of the army. So he's not allowed to join the military because he was at bonkers. Huh? That's Trevor. No, that's not Trevor. That's Giancana. I'm 100% convinced. Okay. We'll argue about this later. <laughs> I'm making you going to buy me beer, too. <laughs> So, no Giancana was also a career gangster, and before he was a teenager, he was known as a top wheel man, which meant he drove cars and he stole cars. Giancana was also a prolific gangster. He made fortunes on top of fortunes for people. I mean, the mob never saw so much money. Giancana, too, was involved in Las Vegas. He was involved in Hollywood. He was involved in all sorts of crazy things. But he was a little flamboyant. At one particular time, he had sued the FBI for harassment and won. The mob didn't like that. They wanted him to calm down a little bit. He was following this work, this girl, Phyllis McGuire, uh, part of this McGuire sister singing troupe, all over the world, just mooning over her, and they didn't like that either. Eventually, they were going to force Sam Giancana into retirement. Now, Giancana, I don't know if he was in Dallas that day, but I'm 90% sure he was probably at that Ferguson meeting the night before. Giancana was tied to the Kennedys in multiple ways. His uh, Kennedy's father, Joseph P. Kennedy, shook Giancana down in a hotel room for a million dollars and said, also, get my kids into the White House. Your problems will be over, Sam. You'll have an ear into the White House. They're going to be off your back. All sorts of wonderful things are going to happen to you. And a lot of people have uh, said years ago, and uh, even up till recently, oh, you can't prove that Giancana rigged the election for Kennedy. And I think I can, because Kennedy took the state of Illinois. The state of Illinois is Abraham Lincoln country. Abraham Lincoln was a Republican. The state of Illinois never once carried the Democratic vote ever in its state history. And now all of a sudden, an Irish Catholic out of Massachusetts is going to carry the Democratic vote in Illinois. Yeah, I don't think so. You had dead people in Chicago vote for Kennedy 25 times. So yeah, I can prove that. I think I just did. Giancana was also had a girlfriend at the time. Her name was Judith Campbell Exner. She also happened to be screwing President Kennedy at the exact same time. And she was delivering messages and money, reportedly. And uh, the uh, Secret Service one time gets a telephone call, and they trace it, and it goes back to Sam Giancana's house. The Secret Service had cancer right there on the spot. And Kennedy starts to distance himself from Giancana. Kennedy, you remember, had also another famous girlfriend, that'd be Marilyn Monroe. 
Sam Giancana knew Marilyn Monroe personally before she was ever famous. He had a hand in her career her entire actress life. The night before, the night before Marilyn Monroe was killed because she was killed, and Giancana took credit for it, whether he actually did it or not, I don't know. She's whooping it up with Sam Giancana and Frank Sinatra at Frank Sinatra's little place there in Reno, Nevada, and, and Marilyn Monroe comes home on uh, Sam Giancana's private plane. And also, the guy who introduced Marilyn Monroe and uh, Judith Campbell Exner was Frank Sinatra. Frank Sinatra campaigned for the Kennedys and sang at the inaugural ball. And when Kennedy finally pushed off all the Hollywood people off to him, Giancana was actually going to have Frank Sinatra killed. He took a sheep's head and sent it to him one time in a hotel room. And Giancana was so terrified that he didn't come out of that hotel room for two weeks. And then at the end, Giancana decided, well, he really liked Frank Sinatra and he just decided not to kill him. Yes. Giancana, like I said, eventually he uh, has to retire. He goes down to Mexico where he stays for years. One day the Mexican government up and deports him back to the United States. When he comes back home, he's in very, very bad health. In fact, I think he needs a kidney operation, and he's put under house arrest. And Giancana, too, is going to have to testify before the House Select Committee on Assassinations. He's down in his uh, little kitchenette that he had built downstairs in his house. Cops are surrounding his house 24, well, they're outside his house 24-7. One day, they decide they need a sandwich. And for all of 18 minutes, they're gone. During this time, somebody comes into Giancana's home, obviously someone that he knew, puts a 22 automatic uh, semi-automatic silence pistol to his head and pulls the trigger. When Giancana hits the floor, they take that pistol, they put it up un underneath his mouth and they empty the magazine. So ending the life of Sam Giancana and so ending my presentation. I want to thank everybody for coming out. We're going to have like a break and then a question and answer thing. And I want to leave you with this. Don't believe anything I say. Try to prove me wrong. If I screwed up a name or a date or I got something wrong, I'll cop to it. But if just one-tenth of what I tell you is uh, true, it ought to scare the hell out of you. Thank you.